Greetings sailors, welcome back to World of Warships, and today I have this tier 10 destroyer game for you courtesy of Raz Zero R King, or possibly Razor King. Yeah, that, that was a joke, just in case nobody noticed, I just thought I'd point that out, because, you know, sometimes my humour is so subtle and profound and witty that it might possibly go past most people's attention, and I think that was the case that time. Anyway... <laughs> He's in the, uh, the tier 10 Soviet destroyer, which barely qualifies, the Haborovsk. It was, in fact, a destroyer leader, and it's big. It's basically a small cruiser. Now, it's got the same 130mm guns that you find on a lot of the, uh, the Soviet uh, destroyers. But in terms of playing it like a destroyer, you can't, really. Um, it's, I think, got the best range of the uh, Soviet DDs in terms of torpedoes, and that's not difficult. Up until tier seven, they mostly have four kilometer torpedoes. This has the option of 10 kilometer torpedoes or six kilometer torpedoes. Now, the base detection range of this is 10 kilometers. This is not a stealthy ship. Like I said, it's the size of a cruiser, pretty much. And when you consider that this is pretty big for a destroyer, and then you look at the Moskva, which is actually uh, a thing that's just hoving to view, and the fact that that is basically, in terms of its length, the size of a battleship, it makes you wonder if there was ever a tier 10 Soviet battleship, not that there could be such a thing, it would have to be entirely fictitious, but if there ever was such a thing, just how huge would it be? Anyway, he's already come to uh, a sudden literal deceleration uh, <laughs> stop. What the hell was it I came up with that for that Otago video? I can't even remember now. A rapid, unplanned, literal deceleration or something like that. He crashed into an island. And I don't think he meant to. I think he was just so intent on uh, everything that was going on around him that suddenly there was an island in the way and it, it somehow had snuck up on him and he hadn't noticed. And that does happen when you're playing warships sometimes. You're so focused on uh, what's going in around you that uh, occasionally islands just appear in front of you out of nowhere, which is very inconvenient, as one might imagine. So, basically, any notion of stealth is out of the window. I mean, I think he's got camo on this. I've not been paying attention. I should know a thing like that, surely, from looking at the replay, but I would assume he does. I don't know what state his captain was in. I don't know if he's got the fifth point captain skill, but even with all, with all of those, um, this is still never going to be a stealthy ship at all. You could at least, with the camo and the captain's skill, get this to a stage where, in theory, you could make stealth torpedo drops. But that is not going to be the focus of Racer King here at all. He's mostly going to be using the guns. And he is going to get a couple of torpedo hits in this game. But uh, he's going to fire a lot of shots. And he's going to land a lot of hits. But obviously, you know, the, the hits that, that land are nothing compared to the actual number of shots that are fired. So at the moment, he is just trying to keep this Kugero engaged. And this is, I mean, it's a bit risky. He's right at the forefront here. And although this is a fast ship, it's also, like I said, it's, it's not small. This is not a small target for a, a destroyer. So if... It wasn't the case that uh, between him and the enemy cruisers that he knows are up to his north, if there wasn't a bunch of islands in the way, this would be considerably riskier. And he's also got planes coming for him as well. But it's not like he's alone here. There are other allied ships nearby. In fact, it looks like they have a numbers advantage over here. So, one of his torpedoes actually finds his mark. For some reason, that Kagero just pulled to a dead halt. Not sure why. And so uh, that, that was a nice first kill. In fact, that was the first blood uh, award for the match because nobody else had killed anything yet. And it's already over five minutes in. So this has been a rather slow paced game so far. I mean, usually in the first two to three minutes, depending on the map, not a lot happens anyway. But even so, that was um, quite a long time for uh, nobody to have died. So he's actually switched to AP shells for that rune, although I think his um, primary intent right now is to cap, because they've only got one cap circle, they've only got C, and they really do need to get uh, another one. But they're not that far behind on points, because it's not like they've been losing ships or anything like that. 
But uh, still, he's going to have to be careful here because that carrier, and there are two on each team, at least one of the carriers is coming after him. And this is, like I've repeatedly said, this is not a small ship. Now the AA is actually not that bad for a destroyer, but he doesn't have the uh, he doesn't have the uh, uh, defensive AA. And I think it's only the is it the Lo Yang, or is it the American destroyers? Or am I getting completely confused? I don't have any high tier destroyers. My highest is the Hatsaharu, the, the TSM Japanese, and I don't have the uh, the Lo Yang, which is the uh, uh, the Taiwanese Benson, essentially. But, uh, yeah, I know there's one or two destroyers that do get defensive AA. But I don't know if the Soviet ones do. And it's one of those things where you can't look it up unless you actually own the ship. And I don't even... I, I have not played the Soviet destroyers myself, literally, since the, uh, the, the preview of the line. So it'll probably be quite a while before I get around to these. So he sees the Moskva is very low health, that is just a single HE hit, but unfortunately yeah, he does not manage to sneak in with a kill, that's one of his own uh, carriers that gets that kill. But that's fine, that means he is now free to move up because not only one but both enemy carriers are actually on this flank. And between himself and the Kigero there is a chance to really uh, do some mischief to the enemy team here because these guys... I'm not quite sure why they came over here. They they had ample opportunity in the minutes leading up to this to start withdrawing over to the west of the map, which is where the bulk of the enemy team is. And instead, they both stuck around over on this side where their own forces were clearly outnumbered. So just in terms of um, gaining control of the air, but not only that, in terms of getting quite a lot of points off the enemy team and gaining quite a lot of points themselves, uh, this is a really nice opportunity. So, he's um, pelted this guy with a bunch of HE shells, and it's not just him shooting this guy, I think the Ibuki and the Iowa will be as well. Um, he's actually switching between AP and HE, because of course the HE will mean they, uh, if they go on fire, they can't take off their aircraft, which is a bit of a threat now, because he's not got that much health left. But also, um, of course, the AP, uh, and, and although these are high tier carriers, it's not like they still have a lot of armor. Uh, the AP is going to just do more damage in the same amount of time. Well, in terms of uh, penetrating hits anyway, I mean, if you get multiple fires going on a ship, that can rack up very rapidly. So he's splitting his fire a bit. The uh, Shikaku is actually managing to stay stealthed more effectively than the Taiho, although the Taiho has been more or less continuously on fire for about the last minute now. And of course, being on fire does increase your visibility. But because the Shikaku keeps disappearing off the radar, they've, they've not had a chance really to try and light him up yet. And they, in fact, they just seem to be focusing their efforts on the Taiho rather than trying to keep them both alight at the same time. And that means the Shikaku is free to try and... Uh, take out uh, Razor King, which he does, and now Razor King's on fire, and uh, it's fortunately just one fire, but it's, it's, like I said, it's not like he's got a lot of health left at this stage. So it looks like the Torp Bombers are actually going for the Kagero, it's not entirely clear, but oh, no, there they go, there's the drop being made, and because there are fighter aircraft, friendly fighters in the skies above, that drop gets disrupted. So he's able to just kill his speed, turn in a bit, and easily avoid those. But there's another squad that looks like they're incoming, so he's going to have to be careful here. And this actually might force him to turn in a direction he doesn't want to. And there's also an island ahead of him, so again, he's going to have to be careful. But it looks like that squad is in fact going for the Iowa instead, so you can breathe easy. In the meantime, they have lost the C point, but they are just about to cap B. There we go, the Ibuki gets that. And although their own team in the West has been forced to make a, a fighting retreat, it looks like there's some, been some very heavy contact between the two teams uh, over on that, that Western flank between uh, A and uh, uh, C. They are, I mean, it's not been... A completely one-sided affair. They have inflicted some casualties themselves. They are forcing these guys uh, to engage them 
they're not entirely just folding and uh, collapsing like a wet paper bag. So although it's still two cap circles each, they are slightly ahead on points. And the fact that they've taken out both the enemy carriers gives their own carriers free reign at this stage. So he's racked up a bunch of damage with his guns. That's over 50,000. And undoubtedly he's done some fire damage as well. And now he's spotted that enemy Kigero trying to make a move through the middle. Presumably to make an attack run on the Iowa. So, Razor King, although he's low health, has put himself on a course to intercept. Now, the Kigero, uh, there's all kinds of planes going overhead. He knows he's spotted. He must know he's spotted. And so, although this is kind of obvious what he's doing, Razor King only drops one lot of torpedoes. Because I think he has the suspicion that the Kigero is not just going to keep going forward and plow around the corner. Because... Well, that would be... It, it's kind of one of those those moments when you just have to assume that there's somebody waiting there for you. And if the Kigero didn't know before, he knows now, because that's a bunch of torpedoes that just slammed into the rocks ahead of him. But you'd think, knowing that uh, a bunch of torpedoes have just slammed into the rocks ahead of him, you'd think that would make him even more cautious about trying to peek around. And there goes the second lot of torpedoes. And there goes the Kigero. And the question is, are they going to intersect? And the answer is yes. So that was a bit of a, a misplay from the Kigero, to be honest. I'm not entirely sure why he tried to sneak through the middle when he knew he was seen. At that point, I think I'd have just reversed course and tried to get the hell out of there. But uh, no, he made a go of it and it all went very badly wrong because, well, they knew he was coming. And with destroyers, if you're trying to sneak up on somebody, if that element of surprise is gone, then uh, it, it's kind of a no-brainer that they're going to be waiting for you. And that's half the, the thing when playing destroyers, uh, if you're trying to play sneaky destroyers anyway, um, the, you, you just have to try and get the element of surprise where you can. And sometimes you, yeah, you have to just throw caution to the wind and have a go anyway but at that point you're playing mind games with people and you're trying to second guess their reactions and in this case that guy just guessed completely wrong so that was uh, a couple more torpedo hits a third kill which is very nice it puts the damage counter up to 65,000, and they are by now way ahead on points because there's only two enemy ships left so actually they're just about to win this one on uh, victory points so there we go, 1,000 points, and he's won. Now, he lost a lot of health early on, but it didn't really matter that much as it turned out um, because it, it, the situation on that flank was such that he was able to press forward and just keep doing the damage and be aggressive. And his efforts were rewarded with, as you can see there, over 100,000 damage just, and a base XP approaching 3,000, which is not bad. It's not bad at all. There's a couple of other players on his team that did pretty well as well, of course. Um, the Zhao that was on the western flank clearly did a, a lot of damage as well and uh, must have been a, a mainstay of that particular part of the fleet. But uh, yeah, all in all, it was not a, a bad game at all. And um, it maybe shows you some of what you need to be able to do in this ship to make it work. It, it is not a stealthy ship at all. You just have to assume that you're going to use your guns, I think, most of the time, and you have to assume that you're going to be spotted most of the time, and uh, you have to be able to act accordingly. But I think the the speed of these ships in particular and their firepower means that for some people... Uh, I mean, if you're a, a player that enjoys the cruiser play style, maybe the Soviet destroyers would be more to your speed uh, than, say, the Japanese ones, for instance. And I, I think there's, there's kind of an interesting crossover there in that regard. Anyway, hopefully you've enjoyed this bit of gameplay, and if you have, you can leave any comments below, you can hit that like button, you can sub to my channel if you aren't already, and as always, stay tuned for more.